Okay, I'm Alex, and uh, so we just heard about the way to write macros that you would want to use, and so I'm going to talk about macros that you would never want to use. <laughs> so I figured I should have a cat on my slide, but this would be a more relevant kind of cat. You might have seen this April Fool's joke. But really, it's this cat program. So I just want a quick show of hands who can read this program. Okay, great. So most of you I'm going to be introducing to BrainFuck, so that's great. Uh, and by the way, I hope you, for this talk you don't consider BrainFuck to be profanity because I'll be saying it a few times. Okay, so we just had a whole talk about this, but I'll go through real quickly what I think of as macros. So uh, what if I told you I have a new language? It's pure functional language, weak typing, homo iconic, it's mostly pattern matching. Okay, but this language is REST macro rules. So a macro is just a function, except it runs at compile time, and it basically processes code into other code. The inputs and outputs are both REST syntax. And the output has to be a complete part of REST syntax, like a complete function or item or expression or whatever. And so uh, when you can't produce your complete uh, element right away, you have to write a recursive macro. Uh, so then you can get around that restriction by like passing some incomplete results as arguments to another macro, do some more processing, accumulate your permutations or whatever, and then I'll put something at the end. So uh, these end up being called munchers, often because they tend to munch one token at a time. Uh, and specifically, I'll be talking about BF, which munches BrainFuck syntax, runs it at compile time, and then hands the output of the BrainFuck program to REST C to compile. Um, so here's a little preview. Here's a call to the macro, uh, and here's a BrainFuck program. Uh, and here is some input, which kind of looks like numbers, and there's something weird about it, but we'll get to that later. And after the macro is expanded, this is what it looks like. So it's uh, basically a struct literal, and the only computation that's left to do is adding up 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, and then it prints this. Uh, OK, so that was a preview. What is this language I'm talking about? So BrainFuck is what's called a Turing tar pit, which means it's Turing complete. You can compute any computable function, but it's really annoying to compute any computable function <laughs> because BrainFuck is basically an assembly language with eight instructions. Uh, so I'm going to go through those instructions one by one with a little cartoon and some REST code to illustrate what I'm talking about. So the BrainFuck abstract machine is uh, a big array of bytes of U8s and a pointer to the current cell. So here's a drawing of some cells and a pointer to the current cell. Uh, so the, the first type of instructions you can do are shifting the pointer back and forth. Shift right, shift left, and those are the instructions are angle brackets. Um, so in Rust, you would just be you know, changing this index. You can also increment and decrement the value in the current cell with the plus and minus instructions. Um, you can do input and output. So here is a std in, and here is std out. And so you can do input one byte at a time. Uh, so usually ASCII, but uh, my implementation does support new code if you want. Um, and the last two instructions are actually the most interesting because they're the only control flow instructions. The only control flow you can do is loop, and it's basically a while loop with uh, only one condition available. So the code, or the instructions within the square brackets in your BrainFuck program will repeat as long as the current cell doesn't drop to zero. Um, cool, so how are we going to implement this in a macro? So I obviously don't have time to go through the whole thing, but I'm going to go through a few specific parts of the macro and techniques we use to implement this. Um, so the first question is, what are we going to do about integers? We just saw that, uh, that tuple indexing and succession macro that uh, does some special cases of addition because macros don't know what integers are. Basically, the data structure they have that we can use is tokens and lists of tokens. So that's how I'm going to define integers. Uh, an, an integer n is a, list, a square bracketed list of n times empty parentheses. 
So here is one token, and, a, and a, a number n is a list of n tokens. And so this is kind of a recursive definition. Um, oh, by the way, this is Zermelo from ZF set theory, just a bunch of sets. Um, so because this is a recursive definition, I can write it as a recursive macro. So if, if my input is a list of n tokens and I want to increment, I just add one more token. And if I want to decrement, let's say I have at least one token, and then I have some more, and I just toss out the first one, and so I've decremented my numbers. Um, so just a quick example, here's that machine again. I put numbers in the cells, and the, the current value is two. So that's two tokens. We can increment. We get three tokens. We could decrement, and it's just a list of two tokens. OK, uh, a little bit more complex is representing the memory, this uh, array of cells. Because I really need an array, but macros don't have arrays. So you can't index into a list. You can only like, look at what's at the beginning of the list, um, like this. So we're going to use a really cool data structure called a zipper, where you can represent a list and the current position in a list with no indexing at all. Um, and we do that by storing three things. We store the current value, so two. We store the values to the right, three and four. And we store the values to the left, zero and one. Um, and then we, when we want to move, the, we just adjust those three different things. So here, here's what that looks like written down as a macro rule. So it's a little harder to read. But you can see in, uh, in this set of square brackets, uh, I'm taking like the first element and the rest. Uh, so this is the elements to the left, the current element, and the elements to the right. Uh, so for example, the current element is 2, elements to the left, 1 and 0, elements to the right, 3 and 4. You might notice that these are stored in reverse order. Um, so let's see what happens if we move to the left. Now the current element is 1. There's only one element to the left and these three to the right. If we move back to the right, and again, so if you look closely, the only thing I need to do, because uh, these were stored in reverse order, is I only need to touch the beginning of the two lists. So we can do that in a macro. That's good. No indexing. Um, yeah. OK, so we have integers. We have a memory full of integers. Uh, next big question is, how do we do those loops? Um, so I'll review the semantics of looping in BrainFuck. Um, if we get to an opening square bracket, if the current, uh, if the pointer is pointing at a cell with non-zero, we go start executing the loop. Otherwise, you just skip the whole thing. And if we get to a closing bracket, if the current memory cell is non-zero, you go back to the beginning of the loop. Otherwise, we're done with the loop. So the best data structure that I came up with to implement this is two stacks. Um, so one, because the loops can be nested, uh, we need a stack of the currently executing loop bodies. Um, but when I'm executing a loop, I have this uh, variable, or really just a macro argument, that's keeping track of the rest of the program to execute. And during a loop, I just set that to the body of the loop. So when we exit uh, an inner loop, we need to remember the code to execute after that. So that's what I call the tail stack. By the way, the parsing is not very hard because macros already know how to match brackets. Um, someone has written a brainfuck uh, compiler in Rust macros that doesn't do this, uh, and it's called ook. Uh, I'll have a link to it later. OK, so I'm going to try to illustrate this with the two stacks. So here's my machine again, and I'm showing three things, the rest of the program that's left to go, the loop stack, and the tail stack. So we're just going to run through this program. OK, let's go. First, it's pretty easy. We're going to imp increment the current cell. And notice when an, when, a, when an instruction executes, uh, it gets popped off of the list of instructions that are left. Um, so now we get to the beginning of the outer loop, and the current cell is not 0. So we push the loop body. We push the tail, so what's left of the program after the loop. And then the future instructions to execute just become the body of the loop. OK, now there's another loop. Uh, and if you know BrainFuck, you recognize this uh, loop with just a minus in it. It's going to zero out the cell. OK, so again, I've got an outer loop and the, or sorry, an inner loop, and the current cell is not zero. So we push the loop body. 
we push what's after the loop body, and the program is just this minus. So that decrements the cell. And now we're at the closing bracket. And the current cell is still non-zero, so nothing happens here. But uh, the future program to execute is the body of the loop again. So it decrements the cell again. And now, when we get to the end of the loop, the current cell is zero. So we're going to pop those two entries from the top of the stacks because we're done with the loop for now. <laughs> and then so the future program comes from remembered from the tail stack, and it becomes these two instructions here. So we move, uh, increment this cell, and we're at the end of the outer loop, and the current cell is non-zero, so we take the loop body that's on the top here, we peek this stack, and put it in the future program instructions. And uh, this is going to go a little faster. It decrements again, and it moves over. Uh, and this ends up being an infinite loop. So it increments this cell, and then it's going to clear it out and move over. And then we would run out of space. So instead, uh, we're going to look at some macro code that actually does this. All right. Ready to take a deep breath to, to see some macro code. So there's four cases. Actually, there's six, but I'm showing four. Um, <laughs> so the first case is when we get to the beginning of the loop and the current cell is zero, because this is the easiest case. We can just skip the loop. So here's some code. Uh, at the top, you can see the inputs to the macro. Uh, and the bottom, it just calls itself again with, with new arguments. I'm going to have some color coding. OK, so this is the current instruction. So the current instruction at the beginning is the entire loop in the brackets. Um, here's the state of the machine. So here's that zipper I talked about. Here's the current cell, elements to the left, elements to the right. Um, and this is the rest of the program that's left to be executed, and the loop stack and the tail stack. And so you'll notice that all of these are just lists of tokens. And so to skip the loop, we take the code that was in the loop, and we throw it away. And the next instruction to execute we take from the, from the program list. And then the instructions left after that are the rest of the program from before. And everything else is unchanged. For a little bit more complexity, what happens when the current cell is not 0, and we need to, so we need to um, enter the loop? Uh, code and more colors, same colors. OK, so again, the current instruction is the entire loop, but we have to deconstruct it into the beginning of the loop and the rest of the loop, because the next instruction that the machine executes is the first one from the body of the loop. And the future instructions are the tail of the loop plus this special token to mark the end of the stream. And then we take our two stacks. For, for the loop stack, we're going to push the loop body on the beginning. And the tail stack, we push the rest of the program that uh, has, that we're not executing anymore because we entered the loop. Um, OK, that's two cases. How about closing brackets? The f easier case is when we close the brackets and the current cell is 0, so the loop is over. Um, whoops, colors. So the current instruction now is this magic end of code sentinel value. And the current cell, the memory in the current cell is 0. So we take our two stacks, and we're going to pop off the entry from the top. So we pop the loop stack, loop's head, and throw it away. The rest, and the loop stack is the rest of it. We pop the tail stack. So you see the rest of the tails becomes a tail stack. And we're, this is the code that we remembered to run after the loop. So the next instruction is the first one from here, and the rest of them are just the rest of it from here. Lastly, uh, when the current cell is not 0, we're going to restart the loop. This is actually a little bit easier, because uh, we don't have to touch the tail stack. And all we do is we peek at the first element of the loop stack. So it's a peek, not a pop. The loop stack is unchanged. Um, but the next instruction to execute is the first one from the top of the loop stack, and the rest of it is the rest of the loop body. So this is a. We just went through a lightly edited part of, a, of an important part of the macro. Um, so that was pretty cool. I bet 
you're ready to see a demo. So hopefully this works. <laughs> So um, here's some code, uh, and we're defining a const called machine of type machine, and the whole value of the const is going to be constructed by the macro, which has two inputs. Um, first is the brainfuck program. So uh, this is actually basically the, the normal hello world program, but I modified it to do something um, and then the second input is a bunch of numbers. I mentioned that macros don't understand numbers. And so the BF macro actually has a parser for decimal numbers, and you just have to have every digit as a separate token, uh, and then it works great. <laughs> oh, and by the way, we need a pretty high recursion limit for this <laughs> macro. It doesn't have to be quite this high, but it doesn't work with the default. OK, so if we run this code, it's pretty fast, <laughs> um, and it works. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so you see, this is the output that got printed, and uh, this is the basically the state of the memory cells that's left over. Thank you. Um, OK. so. I just wanted to mention real quick that uh, there's a long tradition of implementing brainfuck in ridiculous environments. Like uh, Ook or Hodor that I mentioned before is a brainfuck compiler from brainfuck syntax to Rust syntax. So it doesn't run at compile time, but it compiles the brainfuck. Um, uh, SD Leffler made this insanity in the type system, implementing smallfuck, which is like brainfuck with pools instead of U8s. Someone has implemented it in Vim. Someone has implemented a full Turing machine in PowerPoint. <laughs> and every time I go to finish this slide, there's been another one. So uh, you, can, you can look these up. Uh, they're telling me I have exceeded my recursion limit. So uh, the code I talked about in the talk is here, uh, although I should probably clean it up more. But you can find it online. And I'll invite questions. Oh, that's old code. Questions? Thank <laughs> you.